Hey, there we go. Welcome back to the live stream. My name is Jeff Fritz. This is Fritz and Friends, and we're going to write a little bit of code today. Good morning to everybody there in the chat room. Thank you so much for the... There we go. There's a first follow already. Jonathan McPhail, thank you for the follow, but thank you everybody in the chat room for those kind birthday wishes. Let me look over here so I'm looking at this. Uh, Shy Sharp, Ashley, uh, Moz, good morning, Moz. Worldwake, Joker, Orgbrat, Lane Ling, Tsarnal, and Brave Cobra. Hello, hello. Thank you so much. Yes, Veronica caught me this morning. <laughs> and Vinny, good morning. Uh, I put a tweet on Twitter saying, happy birthday. And for some reason, my iPhone corrected birthday to birthday with an O. And Veronica was on it. <laughs> Saw that and immediately wrote back. <laughs> <laughs> Caught my spelling mistake. Thank you. <laughs> uh, thank you, RHT341, and out of T exception. Good morning, good afternoon, wherever you might be. Synaptic Code, hello, hello. And, oh my gosh, sequel Mr. Magoo is here as well. Thank you. Um, new hat today, look at that. Look at that. I I look like I actually belong on this platform now. Um I went and picked up a, a Twitch hat. I had a, uh, a sponsor picked up a couple things for me. Uh, so you see, I, I hope you could tell I've got a new camera here today. This is a Razer Keo. The box is going to be green screened out a little bit here. If I turn off the green screen, look at this. I'm actually going to turn off the green screen. This is like, th this is like uh, going behind the scenes here. Watch this. I'll turn off the chroma key. <gasps> Right, so there, I got a brand new, this is the Razer Keo camera from our friends at Razer, and it's got a light on it. So it's 1080p, 30 frames a second, and it fills in really nicely. Looks so much better. Camera's much clearer today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I live in the Matrix. Oh my gosh. Twitch Loft, thank you for the kind cheer. Oh my gosh. I really appreciate the bits. Uh, video's more bright and clear. Thank you. And I live in a green void. So, yeah, I've got the fake office behind me. You can't really tell. So, Tom RM, thank you for the follow. So, <clears throat> I, um, uh, let me come back to those bits. Twitch Law, thank you so much for the bits. I'm going to match those bits, and we're going to make a donation to Girl Develop It. They help uh, women and underserved minorities learn how to write code just like we're going to do right here. Which reminds me, I want to listen to, to some music to code by. Let me get that started up here. Uh, today I think I'm going to play, I think I'm going to play, this was originally called Chartreuse, and I really enjoy this. There we go. It's all a simulation. Kind of. Kind of. Uh, I set up some limit in sending messages, says IT Goran. Um, no, I didn't set up a limit. There's... It looks like some folks are getting caught by the, uh, there we go. There's no limit turned on on the chat room. Other, where'd it go? Let's see. No, I have no limit on my chat room. So, because you're sending messages too quickly, well, there is that. That has happened before. Turned it on, turning it on and off again did fix it last time. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so uh, let's see. So we've got our music playing. Got a new hat. Time to update the streaming gear on Twitch. Read me. I do. I do need to update that. I have gotten a couple new pieces of gear in here, um, and it is kind of cool having the green screen and just able to swap out with whatever background that I want. Uh, let me see here. I'm looking at my chat configuration. No, it's not under permissions. Moderation auto mod blocked. No, no, no. Oh, man. Where did they put... Did they move around the settings on this bits and cheering? Ignore slow mode. Allow. That's for subscribers. That's a subscription configuration. I'm not doing anything with that. Channel and videos. Chat options. Uh, email verification does need to be turned on. You must verify your email address. Non-mod chat delay is zero seconds. There is no delay. There is no block on it. 
So happy time zone. <laughs> yes. Uh, Surface Go just came available in several countries. Oh, that's cool. And the .NET Rocks was posted today. Yes, let's make sure we we highlight that. Um, so if you joined us about about a, three weeks ago now, um, we did a, this was this was the first time I've ever seen anybody try this. So kind of cool that, that <laughs> we did it first. We did, um, we did a crossover stream podcast with .NET Rocks, right? .NET Rocks, long time podcast. From even before there was such a thing as a podcast. Back in 2000, 2001, these guys started. 1,575 episodes, including the one that came out today, there was a crossover with yours truly, uh, talking about why you'd want to code on Twitch. What's so great? What's so fun about about doing this? What we're doing here, and what makes it interesting? So here's the podcast that was the recording of us <laughs> doing our uh, doing our stream. And um, if you're interested and you want to see the actual video. It's over on YouTube in the archive. And, uh... Hi there. Ooh, there's that guy with the hair. Uh, da, 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 where is it? It is in the videos. Da, 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 da. Come on. There they are. Camtasia 2018. Is all about yep, Camtasia. So, .NET rocks on Fritz and Friends. There you go. So, yeah, yeah. And there was the actual recording that we did. So that was a lot of fun. If you're interested, you want to watch and see it from the other side after you hear the MP3, see some of the things that they're talking about, there it is. So it was a lot of fun. We recorded it, like I said, about two weeks ago now. I think it was the 15th. So that was awesome. Hey, Dev Chatter, thank you so much for the host. 15 viewers coming over from there. That's awesome. Thank you, thank you. All right. So I think that gets us up to date. New camera, new hat, .NET rocks, birthday. Um, what do you say we write some code? I think that sounds like fun. So. Uh, we've got a couple pull requests that I'd like to review, and then I want to continue our work on CoreWiki where we're bringing in our new architecture. We're introducing CQRS to a very CRUD-oriented, right? A very create, read, update, delete-oriented application that started off very simple and very much like you might have in your applications back at your place of business or, or whatever. Um, it's grown from being just just you know simple interaction direct with the database to something a little bit more complex where we have some business rules that we want to manage we want to make sure are processed properly in the right order and uh, we're going to take a look at how we can implement the CQRS pattern the command query uh, responsibility separation architecture into this project and get it to to grow and be a little bit more maintainable We've grabbed a couple of domain names that we can deploy to, and uh, I think we're gonna we're gonna start talking about deployment either Thursday, maybe early next week. Which leads me to an announcement. Gosh, I've got an announcement. Ooh. Our next workshop. Here it is. Ready? Next workshop. Friday, September seven, and you'll see it pop up. Hey, look. Uh, my birthday, happy birthday, my birthday. Let me, that's kind of annoying there, but thank you, Windows. My birthday, happy birthday, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I get it. Um, so uh, here we are today, but next Friday, the 7th, it's locked and loaded. I have a phenomenal set of presenters for this one. You, it, it doesn't get any better than this. Write it down in your book. Tell your friends, tell your families, post a message on Reddit, tell the folks on Hacker News that they, that they need to tune in. It's a live DevOps workshop, all right? Everything you want to know about DevOps, and I'm not doing .NET, I'm doing DevOps, 
okay? We're going to do Linux. We're going to do Kubernetes. We're going to do Helm. We're going to do all the cool things that you need in order to maintain, deploy, and run your application. And I've got four amazing guests that you're, you're not going to believe are joining me. All right? Donovan Brown is going to join us. We've got Oren Novotny, our friend who joined us and showed us how to deploy some of our work uh, previously. He's coming back and he's going to join us. Uh, Jessica Dean is going to take us through all kinds of cool Kubernetes configuration stuff. Really looking forward to that. And Abel Wang is going to be our fourth presenter. And we are going to have an amazing time learning about DevOps. This is going to be a six-hour workshop next Friday. The event will be posted on the Visual Studio channel over on Twitch. If you're not familiar with it, Twitch TV, Visual Studio, you're going to be able to tune in there and you'll be able to catch all six hours. And it's going to show me hosting, me being hosted right now over here on Visual Studio, if I know right. Uh, but you'll see on the brand new Visual Studio channel, it's going to be our first event that you'll, you'll find over here. And it'll also be on the new Mixer Visual Studio channel as well. So you'll be able to go to one, either of those two services. You'll be able to find us running this workshop live, all about DevOps. And uh, you'll see a link coming out for me a little bit later today with a link to the event. So you can tune in and learn all about that. It is it, it's shaping up to be really, really nice. Uh, let's see. Uh, at least fixed point. Thank you for the birthday, kind birthday wishes. Performench had a nice chat with Donovan when he was here in Aust Austria a few months back. Really interesting what he did with VSTS. Yes, Donovan's done a lot. And uh, you, if you've seen the format of our workshops, you know that they're not here to talk to me. They're here to answer your questions to help you learn and really be that workshop format. So I think we're going to have a great time with that. Hey, Fred, yeah, good to see you. Thank you. So uh, I'm really looking forward to that. So the, the Rainbow Beard Challenge, I got to call that out. 3331. We, we ticked over 3,000 while we weren't looking here. Or we did just at the end of Saturday, something like that. But uh, 3331, that's pretty good. Uh, I, I expect to see that number grow a bit as folks start to listen to the .NET Rocks podcast. And they, and they uh, start joining us. Lucky number 11 says, uh, or am I the owner of the VS channel? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. So our first big event is that workshop next week, and it's a soft launch. You're going to start to see some of those other shows that are available on... Uh, as YouTube shows come over and appear live on Twitch. Uh, is that is that our Miz? Thank you so much for the follow. I appreciate you joining us. And Steve, I, you're you're getting a little sweaty and busy there today. I didn't I didn't thank uh, a Tamar M. Thank you for the follow as well. A C sharp Fritz cake of birthday made with C sharp. Something like that. I think our friend DevLead is here. He has something to say about cake. Uh, but yes, I'm, I'm the owner of this. We're going to be doing a heck of a lot more with it. The big, big event that you want to tune in for is going to be dot, dot .NET Conf. 24 hours of streaming live on the channel. All of .NET Conf will be available on Twitch and Mixer channels. And uh, it's going to be amazing. Cake needs a target to run right here. Run, run into this. This is my target. Put the cake in the mouth. Ah, Brendan. Hi, Fritz. Thank you so much for the subscription. I appreciate that. And of course, we'll match the, those subscriptions and uh, make donations over to Girl Develop It. And uh, yeah, we're going to make a big deal about that. A very big deal about that. There's Visual Studio hosting me. And look, you can see it right there. All right. Kind of easy to set up your own channel to host you. Kind of. Um, all right. I think we're ready to start writing some code. Oh, lucky number 11. With me being an affiliate with this channel, does my affiliate contract affect the VS channel with regards to Twitch exclusivity and streaming to both Twitch and Mixer? The VS channel, while I operate it, hosts a lot more content than me. 
my content is here and gets hosted over there. So stuff that I produce that I run is here. You will see stuff that my employer is promoting and doing over there. I operate it. So unless it's a show that I'm running that's specific to me and is not affiliated with that organization, you will see it here. So that's the dividing line. Very similar to, to what you may see with, with folks like, uh, like Scott Hanselman. He has a podcast, and he also has, he also has Azure Fridays. Similar type of breakdown. And uh, also, you may notice the Visual Studio channel is partnered. So there's, there's some other things going on there as well. We are very well aware of our relationships. So, okay. Uh, let's take a look. I've got a couple pull requests that I'm, I'm very thankful to see here. Um, we've got the, the first one is something that we've been talking about for a little bit here that our friend Chris Jones was working on regarding the dark theme CSS in CoreWiki. So if you're if you're not familiar with CoreWiki, this is a very uh, this is that application we've been working on um, since March here on stream. You can find all the videos where we're building it on the YouTube archive. All the source code is here on my GitHub repository. Um, but you can check in here and learn all about it, tinker with it, break it, send a pull request, and we'll talk about it here on stream, just like Chris did, where he's tweaking the dark theme CSS for CoreWiki. So CoreWiki comes with three themes out of the box that are all based on Bootstrap 4 that our friend Smab in the chat room did a really nice job putting together, but there was some tuning that needed to be done, and Chris took a shot at updating the the dark theme here and we had a little bit of discussion back and forth about how to properly uh, implement a theme using the the bootstrap toolkit because bootstrap has some really nice features that you can light up and all of the widgets will just start to use if you can if you write a script and you start to import other features from the bootstrap source code it'll compile those in and your colors, your thicknesses, the things that you want to customize will get applied and, and look really nice throughout the application. So yes, I, I very much have that sorted. So cakebuild.net, I will click through to that so people see. Um, so the references we're making to cake, this is the C Sharp Make tool that is definitely here. Yep, he's still here, hey there. Um, so Cake lets you write C Sharp in order to build your application. It's a member of the .NET Foundation, so you know you're going to get great support long term. You don't have to worry about, about folks abandoning, abandoning an application when it's committed to the .NET Foundation. You're going to get support, you're going to get legal support in case there's any questions around licensing with stuff that's in the .NET Foundation. It's all ironed out, all that stuff is taken care of, and Cake is a really great way for you to build your application. And then you can take that same build script and throw it over to a service like Visual Studio Team Services or AppVeyor or Jenkins, and you'll have a standard build that'll just run everywhere. Really great tool. Now now available as a .NET Core 2.1 tool. Awesome. Where is there a mention? Cake 030, global tool, look at that. .NET cake, build .cake. That's really cool to see. So you get a standard build every time when you need to, when you need to do more to build your application than just .NET compile, right? Or .NET restore than .NET compile. So check it out. Very cool stuff. And of course, we have a cake build script here in CoreWiki. If you want to see how that was built, it is right there. There it is. So check it out. Really cool stuff. Um, I'm thrilled to be able to use this. And we learned a little bit about Docker last week because we used uh, and we used the, the cake build script to build some Docker containers for us. So really cool. All right. I want to talk about this SAS script. So Chris came through and there was some discussion back and forth about how to properly apply this. And uh, Smab said, you know, here's the way that you apply these settings. There's, when you see this dollar syntax inside of SAS script, it's funny, it's called SAS, 
but the extension is SCSS. It's kind of weird. Um, but when you see this dollar syntax, that's actually a variable, which is when you think about CSS and you want to reuse the same theme colors throughout your application, um, having a variable for colors is really handy. So you have these standard variables that are used throughout the bootstrap theme. And what's happened here is they've defined some additional variables and here's what we're going to apply to those. So, um, and Chris pushed through a, another uh, update here. So if we look at the files changed, so we don't want to update our CSS files directly. Um, with the way that this is structured using Bootstrap, we update a theme SAS file, that SCSS file. Let me scroll down to one of those. And then when our application builds, it'll actually take the, the source code for Bootstrap and it'll take this information, merge them together, and you'll end up with a complete CSS file and then a minified CSS file. So it doesn't have all that extra goo, the spaces. It'll make everything nice and small and tight so that we can deploy it real easy. So, um, hey there, ancient coder, DevXer. Mmm, cake. Yes. I don't have, I don't have any Homer sound effects, but uh, I can give you some points for that. There you go. All right. Um, so let's, um, this is actually on the dev branch, right? This has been going on for a little bit since, since before we started working on our new data changes. But really, uh, the only file that's really changed here is the SAS file. And to merge these changes down into our, our new data project branch, I don't have too much of a problem with. So I want to take a look at this before I merge it because we have had a little bit of conversation back and forth. I do want to verify that it, it does look proper. So I'm going to grab the command line commands here and I'm going to open PowerShell, jump over to my core wiki folder. How's that font size? Is that font size all right? Do I need to push that up a little bit? Let me know. Oh, Smab's making a, a point here. The bang default indicator, fine on 720. Good, good, good. So where you see bang default here says, if this isn't set, take the default setting. It's kind of like doing the null, null coalescing, right? The double question mark operator. Wait, so the background is actually a picture. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is, Worldwake. That's a really old text in there. There we go. All right. Um, okay, I wanted to, so I copied uh, this one. All right, let's check out my dev branch. And uh, yep, it's a little bit ahead, that's fine. And now I'll paste in those two commands. So we get the updates and now I'm just gonna run the application locally here and it, it should still work. Um, and that's just a simple .NET run command. Good. Let me know if that font size ever looks a little. It means the left side has already been set. Ignore this definition. It means the left side is our... Oh, 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 oh. I'm sorry. I'll let that run. So let me go back to this. So I'm misunderstanding this. So this is saying if... This is already set. Ignore this definition. Okay. I can buy that. Uh, let's see. Good. There it is. I'm going to open this. Hey, Ahmed Balak. Welcome. So this is Core Wiki. Very simple. Nothing, nothing to really see here. Latest changes with a bunch of articles that are just stubbed that I threw in there so they looked decent and then down here is the theme chooser and it this just sets a cookie so it remembers it and th that looks pretty good the um, the fix that Chris was trying to address here if I go up here this is 251 the my roles page needs some help so when you're logged in and I'll log in with my Twitter account there is roles and permissions. 
that looks better. So, I can deal with that. Um, hey, Fierce Kittens! Good morning, and thank you for those birthday wishes. I appreciate you joining us. Hope you're feeling better. Our friend Fierce Kittens is, is getting ready to go to Dragon Con this week. And uh, she's been she's been fighting a bit of a cold and some laryngitis, it sounds like. Actually, it doesn't sound like. Yeah, that's right. So, that's uh, going to be a problem if it doesn't get cleared up soon. So get some hot tea in India with some honey and get that throat cleared up. Oh my gosh. So I'm really happy with how this looks now. And uh, big thanks to Chris for for putting together this fix. Um, and it's okay that it took a little bit of time to come in. We were able to kind of park this issue and come back to it. So uh, I'm, I'm going to squash and merge and uh, let this all happen out on GitHub. I'm not going to do the commit locally here. Uh, thank you for following up and, uh, and, uh, completing this looks great. Uh, DG Rothman. Thank you so much for the follow. I appreciate you joining us. Um, blue text is not nice. Uh, the blue doesn't come out very good on that dark background. Let's, let's go back over to that for a second. Uh, this... So this blue on the dark background for the links, it's kind of a standard color. Um, and if I go back over to the rolls page, this stuff. So I like the, the blue highlight with the white text. I think that works nicely. Um, there's definitely something we could do here. Instead of making this blue, maybe we make this like a light gray or something. But I think that's a little bit further than it was completely unusable the way that it was. The, I, we had a white background with white text. So you couldn't see this at all. So I'm I'm not opposed if and please if there's any designers watching, you're you're more than welcome to add add additional themes to this. If that makes you happy, go for it. We will uh, always take a look at these types of, of changes and work with it. We didn't have identity in place when the theme was put together. It could change. It could, and we've also got. Um, We've also got some of those new admin user administration pages there that we can work on as well that are, are new to the mix. All right. Um, so let's see. How are we doing? We're good on time. We're amazing on time. So SMAB addressed this issue that we had from our, our core wiki build with Docker that we did at the end of Saturday stream where... Um, we ran into an issue that font awesome. So what we're using to get some of these glyphs, like the search here, um, and also I think it's on the home page. It's not these glyphs, and I, I worry about that look. Um, let me go back to default. Yeah, that still that looks kind of funny. Hmm. Um, but there's a couple places where we have some some glyphs here. Oh, John Kerner, thanks so much for the follow. I appreciate you joining us this morning or this afternoon, wherever you might be. Um, but there, there are a couple places where there it, it's not this one. But the the glyphs are they're hanging out there. They're they're coming in from from Font Awesome. There's other places we do want to use these, and it'd be nice to have them locally. So that when we deploy a uh, uh, Docker a Docker container, we have a local copy if it can't get them off of the CDN. So, and also help us develop offline if necessary. Um, and added library manager .build, so restores happen at build time. Now, if I'm if I know what you're referring to here, yeah. So there was a new feature. Yay, three months. Oh my gosh, i got to stop there. Thank you, Benefice, for the subscription. I really appreciate you joining us three months in a row. I believe that pushes you into the, yep, the Red Mug Club. So, welcome. Th thanks so much for that. And, of course, I'll match the subscription, and we're going to make that donation over to Girl Develop It. Awesome stuff. Hey, Guntbert, good morning. 
There might have been a glyph on the privacy message. Cool. Niyami. Thank you so much for that subscription. Bringing your Twitch Prime here. Uh, I, I've got to call this out. I try and do it only once a show. Uh, if you have an Amazon Prime account, you can turn that into a Twitch Prime account. And for the next month, it will it'll drop the ads that you see here on Twitch before and after my stream. Anybody's stream, actually. And it'll give you one free channel subscription. If you bring that channel subscription to this channel, you'll not only get some of the cool emotes that you're seeing, like SQL Mr. Magoo with the uh, .NET bot there, but you'll also get uh, you get the little mug loyalty icon, and uh, I'll make a I'll match that. You're not spending anything to get the subscription, but I'm going to match that, and we're going to make a donation together to Girl Develop It. Really cool stuff. Uh, thank you so much. And Mr. Magoo, you're right. We were at 3333 33 followers there for a minute, for a hot second. <laughs> Irony. All right. Um, I am loading up on coffee today. Whew. So what Smab did here, now he says he brought in the library manager. Library manager, or, or you'll hear some of the Microsoft folks refer to this as libman, is a, it's, it's, kind of like a package manager for your static web assets. Um, and what this will do is it'll allow you to get files from a different providers and in an integrated way, bring it into your, in, uh, integrated with the .NET build, bring it into your application. This way, you're not going to be beholden to the way that NPM or Yarn or whatever the next tool is that is trafficking and delivering these files. It's literally going directly to the CDN that they're all being kept on, or it's going to the local file system, or you can put in a different provider and it'll go pull from that other location and bring those packages down and make them available to you. Um, should core wiki package lock JSON be git ignored? See uncommitted changed files after build. Um, I've always been told that package lock JSON should not go into Git. NPM generates that file. It doesn't necessarily need it. It generates it and it and it keeps track of it when you do updates. So, Gunpert. Oh, thank you so much for the for that uh, for the birthday wishes. I um yes, I had surgery. It was a week ago today. Um, they uh. They took my face off. Uh, no. Uh, uh, let's see here. They did... Um, yeah, they did this to me. No, no that's, that's what I look like. Yeah, that's what they did right there. Look at that. Ugh, they took my face off. And they... No, they didn't. They, um... They, they put a drill up my nose, actually, and and roto-rooted around in there. They, they don't have roto-rooter in other countries. That's an American thing. Um, but they they went around in there, and I had a bone spur that they cleaned out, and they actually put a stint in there that opened it up, and I had a deviated septum that they got everything lined up right. And you probably can hear I sound a little nasally right now while I'm still adjusting. That's why the new cam was needed. Absolutely, so you can tell... I actually thought it was a bad idea to get a new camera at first because um, this is a face for radio. You know what I mean? Um, so I uh, got that in place and uh, I'm feeling a heck of a lot better. The Bot Show, thank you so much for the follow. I appreciate you joining us. Man, the follow train is hot today. Thank you, thank you. No, my face is not CGI. It isn't. Right? Even though I can do this, right? We can... <gasps> Anyways. Um, so it does generate with every change. Yeah, yeah. Um, the So what Banifis is referring to, that package lock JSON, is it, it, it's for a given release, it should be maintained. Um, but I'm not... I don't see too much of an issue with it right now. Um, and Welsh Ronaldo, I'm sleeping much, much better now. Much better. Uh, Standby Reloading has a Stack Overflow link, and the bot didn't pick that up. The 
bot did not pick that up. No such device or address. Wow, it didn't find that. Let's let's see what standby reloading has for us. Package lock JSON is intended to be checked into source control. If you're using npm5, you may see this on the command line. You should commit this file. Why? Is intended to be committed. Why? Describe a single representation of a dependency tree such that teammates' deployments and continuous integration are guaranteed to install exactly the same modules. I get that, but isn't that why I specified a version number in my project JSON in my package JSON file? Provide a facility for users to time travel to previous states. Why? If I've already got... Let's look at the source code here and I'll, and I'll explain why I'm asking why. No transient dependencies. Ah, let's come back to that. As, uh, da, 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 come on. If, if the transient dependencies are changing, then your package JSON is not doing what you told it to do. And I'll explain. So here is package JSON. And right now we have caret 413. Now, if we didn't include the caret, it's saying just give me the bootstrap 413 package. That's it. I don't need anything else. I don't need to think about anything else. That's all I want. But when you say caret, um, when you put that in there, that is, uh, come on. That is a semantic versioning hint that you're giving, and I'm looking for the official documentation here. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Come here. There we go. Compatible with version. So this is saying, yeah, those are all valid, but come on, give me the semantic versioning bit on that. I'm looking for it. I don't, it, it, and don't even get me started about peer dependencies. Dear Lord, are you making it so much more confusing, NPM. Um, I, let's see. No, 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 no. Semantic versioning. Here you go. This is what I was thinking of. So you issue patch releases where you update the third. This isn't a table. Dear Lord. Tables that aren't tables. All right. So when you specify tilde, uh, I'm sorry, caret there, you're going to get all the minor version updates as well, and you will not get the major version update. When you specify tilde in front of it, you'll get the patch versions applied. So by doing this, we're saying, you know what, it, when this goes to 4.2, give me 4.2 and any patch versions that go along with it. It's basically saying everything after this, give me that. The lock file does some voodoo in Angular. Let me come back to that. Let me come back to that. So my challenge is when I specify and I have now when when you're saying give me the semantic versioning here that makes perfect sense I see I definitely understand wanting to lock and say well I actually installed 414 or 42 I get it I totally buy that it makes perfect sense to me when I do that and it brings down a different version that's a problem because now you've made a decision for me to be more aggressive or to be more conservative than what I requested. If Bootstrap says I can be as aggressive or conservative, and that's what you're doing when you're putting things like the like the carrot or the tilde on there. If Bootstrap says you can be as aggressive or conservative within these constraints, I, as the consumer of Bootstrap, trust that. However, when you go outside of that, and as a package manager, you decide to go and update things to the latest version, and I didn't explicitly tell you to, that's a problem because now you're not doing what I intended. That's my concern. So, uh, there is Fritz with dinosaurs. Yes. 
uh, some say require is greater than version X. And I, yes, I agree, Dev Lead. There are some folks who are very aggressive about that. And in fact, download new versions of NPM every time they install. Consequently, then you end up downloading new versions of everything every time they install, and you end up with these crazy stupid install rates that you see on npmjs.org because they're installing and doing crazy stupid restores every time, which then tells me they're not checking in package lock e JSON either. Um, the lock file does some voodoo in Angular. All right, so this is Jonathan was saying. It defines where Webpack and a couple of other dependencies come from when in, when you ng new. Ah, okay. So Jonathan, what you're suggesting, yes, Webpack isn't in package JSON, is that Webpack has now hijacked the package JSON interaction where package JSON was an NPM construct, and now another tool is saying, well, I'm going to use it for something else. In which case now. All bets are off. And now you've got folks abusing each other's configuration files. And that's that's a scary thing, actually. Uh, will the lock not lock down your dependencies, dependencies as well? Well, at some point it needs to resolve those. It needs to figure out, well, which version should I get? And that's, uh, that's, that's the problem that a lot of folks run into when they get into bigger, more complex projects with lots of dependencies. And, right, let's be uh, perfectly frank here. Looking in core wiki, and we look in node modules, I've only got six of these. But in other projects, dear lord, it can get crazy quick. So here's my hat collection. This is a, this is a, oh, I've, I don't have my, uh, stuff restored there um, in some of my angular projects that I have my node modules is insane no I don't uh, nope not that one is it in here do I have this one nope and I don't want to do an npm restore because it's going to take forever but when they get really insane like that it gets complex it becomes hard harder to understand the resolution of these things gets confusing. Um, good morning, Chef Brent. Thank you. Looks like .NET Core 2.0, 2.1 has breaking changes in it, says standby reloading. It shouldn't. Um, what, uh, what you... It shouldn't have breaking changes in it. If there are, it's unintentional, and uh, yeah, you, you... Let me know what you see there. Um, doo -doo -doo, let's see. Uh, oh, Monomachus85. Hello, is there a way I can check your previous videos? I can only see last 33. Yes, YouTube. So if you if you look below me here in the nameplate, that's not it. YouTube.com slash C Sharp Fritz. All the videos, everything we've ever done here on stream is out there, including our workshops. Uh, check them out. There's, there's a ton of them. Two hour bits um, each. And we have a lot of fun chatting on those, just like we do right now. Um, hi, perfectly frank. <laughs> Biacho, hello, welcome. Um, let's see. The NPM ecosystem loves just including dependencies on their libraries. It's It does quickly balloon, yeah. ASP.NET Core 2.2 does have new Angular and Bootstrap templates. I'm only using two libraries, yeah. Um, and it uh, it will balloon. You can't just set and forget. You have to update the NuGet package, update publish profiles. Yes. Yes, stand by, by reloading. You do have to update your configuration files when you do update .NET uh, version numbers. And it's kind of a good thing to do. Make sure you run all your tests because you're, you're delivering binaries there. You want to make sure you don't break anything. It's a, it's a pretty good practice to test things and not just assume it's going to work with the next version. There are some folks in some other programming languages and disciplines that really get wrapped up that, oh, it should just work. Mm. Features change. That's why they released a new version. 
Modern web app development has gotten more complex. Advancements in web technologies made it that way. Yes. And Chrono uh, 803, you know what? With with Blazor and um, WebAssembly coming, it's getting even more complex. So. Um, LeftPad. LeftPad was f three years ago now. Because I was still on... <laughs> I was still on NuGet at that time. <laughs> but yes. LeftPad was a package inside of um, inside of the node, the NPM repository that, that somebody decided to take offline and everybody relied on it, including the web server. And it literally broke the world. So, all right, let's talk about some of these other pull request that we have here. So this was the local font awesome. So this is using the library manager to move the files around, to copy them down, put them in the right place for us. So instead of having uh, font awesome referenced here, we're going to reference the version that we're going to download. Furfu 8670, thank you for the follow. I appreciate you joining us and uh, great to see you again, Steve. It's been a while. Um, so here's here's the addition that was made to libman json and this is what will manage these things and this is really neat it'll actually pull it out of a node modules folder for us and copy it to where we need so you don't need to fiddle with with things like grunt or gulp or some other script that'll copy files around or write an npm script that'll move things around and dependencies change and whatnot this just says Take these files, put them here. And then here you see my package JSON was opened up and we added a reference to font awesome. Easy, easy. So let's, um, let's merge this in. We'll get those changes and that'll be in my dev branch. Um, thank you for making it easier to use font awesome with core wiki great stuff now i also want to call out that our friends um this was smab and the other one was chris up at the top there's a ticker going by for those of you that haven't seen it before that's all the folks that have contributed to some of the open source projects that we work on here on stream and uh every time we do a commit every time we do a merge we update that and you'll see folks names appear there with here's what they've contributed now we haven't worked on some of these projects in a while but uh, there you go, here comes core wiki and that'll update. Let me force an update on that scoreboard again. And uh, we should see these commits from our friends pop up. There we go. Drega, thank you for bringing your Twitch Prime subscription here. We'll match that, make another donation to Girl Develop It. Thanks so much. Probably makes it a lot easier to use packaged script CSS within firewalls without checking it all into source control. Um, yes and no. At some point, you need to get those files from npm.js inside of your local organization. But once they're in there and they're they're blessed by by whoever the the firewall folks are, who are who are doing your security, yes, then you can just reference them from that local place. Did you notice Fort Awesome? Yes. So Fort Awesome is um, right. Of, so let's just show that real quick. Um, yep, build amazing things. If we go to font awesome, there it is. So this is uh, regular, regular font awesome. Uh, Reaps on EX2. Thank you for the follow. I appreciate you joining us. Um, come on. Error loading page. This is NPM. It never has an error loading a page. Uh, doo -doo -doo. I believe it's Fort Awesome. All right, there it is. Awesome icon sets. Try it now for free. Blah, blah, blah. But you can also get the open source. Do, 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 do. Icon sets. So you can get all the different icon sets, but there's the free ones available here, and it's under that namespace. 
Mm. Where the heck? Powerful CSS served up by CDN. Yeah, give it to me. Where is it? Fontello. But it, yeah, I was looking for Fort Awesome Font Awesome and trying to get it to pop up. Uh, come on. So there it is on GitHub. But I want it to find Angular Font Awesome. Uh, whatever. Well, here it is on GitHub, using Font Awesome on the web with SVG with JavaScript. So that that's what we were using was a script like that. There it is. npm install Fort Awesome, Font Awesome free. So we did the right one. Hey C17, so Fontello will do this also. Okay, that's cool. Uh, we're supporting and using Font Awesome. Do I have a new light system? The lighting on my front left seems a tad bright. This one. New camera's definitely better. Which one is it? This is the Razer Keo that I'm using now. And uh, I think it's kind of nice. It's got a, it's got a light on it. And uh, I, I think it's working very nicely for us great resolution cool yeah so this is my normal desk lamp over here and I sometimes I turn it up so that I can see a little bit better sometimes but the reflection is uh... tomorrow I need to research how to add signal R to my existing MVC project uh, Veronica is that is that MVC 5 that you're adding it to because it, adding signal R Real easy to do to add to an existing MVC project, so should be should be just a few steps. Um, Razer Keo could still be a hundred bucks. Mine was a little bit more than that. It was like one nineteen, something like that. But it's it's one nineteen ninety nine, something like that. It wasn't bad at all. Um, but it's my previous camera was a. Logitech C920, and it was giving me fits. Want to use Blazor? There's no auth bits yet. Well, your authorization should be going on at the server. So, if the tariffs affect it. Oh, jeez. I'm not even going there. All right. So, thanks to uh, Smab's contribution here, we now have font awesome available locally in our dev branch for this great stuff um ashley we've been talking about file nesting preferences and in visual studio you can actually set up your own preferences for how you'd like your files to appear in the solution explorer so if i go to visual studio here you see how things like compiler config and app settings they're nested like this that's nice, and some people have different preferences for how they'd like these things to work together, right? So here's my page model file, and it's all, it's nested in a way that that feels good to me. But this is very much a preference. And um, Ashley has some uh, some different ways they'd like to work with the project, and that's okay. This is strict, this doesn't change the way the project works, but it's a way to maintain a preference. And uh, what Ashley did was just add a reference to the file nesting JSON file here so that it gets ignored and that personal preference stays local on their machine. That's, I think that's a, a, a nice add. Uh, thanks for the contribution. Did I spell that right? I didn't spell that right. Uh, <laughs> You could host it options and add auth server side, what effect blazer side. Yeah, MVC5, there's there's lots of instructions out there for how to do that merge. Um, let's just look something up here real quick for Veronica. Um, adding signal, signal, signal R to MVC project. 
it's it should be as easy as just adding a uh, a NuGet package. Uh, update package manager, install. Don't worry about web platform installer. Don't need that. Uh, set up the project. So you've installed and you've chosen MVC. You, right, you're, you've already got an MVC project. But all you're going to do really is install package. It's going to put down some scripts for you. And then you install these hub classes. And uh, this is the one piece in the configuration you need to do. You need to build this piece so that SignalR knows to start up and knows to start listening. So this is really, it's, it's a, it's a nice add-on that you can drop into an either an MVC or a web forms, an existing ASP.NET project. Now this is the older ASP.NET, 4, 472 and earlier. ASP.NET Core, a little bit, it's, it's actually in the box. And we do some of that with our Stream Tools project where we light up SignalR by literally just saying, add SignalR and it, it, it's there, it just works. Really cool stuff. You're welcome, Veronica. Glad to help out. Good luck with that tomorrow. And uh, let us know if you have any questions, if you have any problems, because SignalR is really cool. All right. Next pull request. Mediator refactorings from Ashley. All right, what do we got for you? 24 files changed. Just a few. One or two. Not too many. Um, so let's see what we got here. Small refactorings to move towards mediator. <coughs> 13 hours ago. Oh boy. I know you stay up late, uh, Ashley, sometimes to join us here, but wow. Okay. Let's see what we got here. And you see the green checks here. This is because I have AppVair wired up to our project and it will build uh It'll build pull requests to verify that all the unit tests, all of our build scripts run properly before we go into any merges. So I, I get an initial pass, an initial valuation that shows uh, that shows it, at the very least you didn't break what I expect to continue working. So that's that's a good start. We can always add more unit tests. We can always add more integration tests, more steps to that to put more weight behind this little check that happens here. But AppVair is completely free for anybody running an open source project to integrate with GitHub and get that type of feedback. All right, let's keep an eye on things here. Looks like our friend Richard Campbell just tweeted about our podcast. Da, 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 da. What do we got here? Something, 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 Twitter, something, something, something. Uh, <laughs> um, there we go. I'm going to like and retweet that real quick. Um, so, so Mrs. C Sharp Fritz, see, see what I did there? Um, this morning had to reset her, uh, I had to reset her Microsoft account. So Microsoft account, what you use to log into Office, uh, Outlook.com, some of those other services, uh, Azure, um, Mixer. Anyways, um, she had to reset her password because she uses that to sign into her PC. And the thing with the PC is you can also now sign into Windows 10 with a pin. She's been signing in with a pin so long she forgot her password. It happens. No big deal. So... Uh, she went to reset her password online, and uh, it's, it wants her to set up two-factor authentication. And when you try to add two-factor authentication in, and you're not someone who is someone who's just technically savvy enough that you you can you know what it means, and you know it's a good thing to turn it on, but you don't have the patience or the time to go and figure out everywhere you need to go and re-sign in and two-factor authenticate with. It's a pain in the neck. She's literally all morning. I know. It's a good thing. It's a it's a one time pain. It's like ripping a bandaid off. But uh, we're getting there. 
What's the difference between verified with and without the check mark? Good question, Freitje. So verified, when I mouse over or I can even click on it, shows that it was signed with a GPG key. It was signed or a PGP key, depending on which tool you use. They're both compatible. One's a completely open source. The other one is I forget what the PGP has all kinds of weirdness going on around it with government restrictions and crap. GPG is completely open source, free for anybody to use. Um, so Ashley has signed their commits so that we verify that yes, this did come from Ashley. And I've started doing this as well to ensure that when you do see commits that come in, they are coming from me. Um, some other folks on, on the teams that I work with at Microsoft do do similar, uh, particularly when we issue releases. We want you to be sure and have that confidence that the code that you're getting, the product you're getting, was in fact built by the folks who say they built it. So it's, it's, a, it, it's a nice check that you're able to see. Um, da, 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 da. Some of those commits were pushed to the remote repo at the same time. Yes, so it only builds once. Right. No reason to constant to rebuild for each one of these. Just do the last one. You can do two-factor authentication with durable functions. Um, that feels strange. The QR code with Win10 Enterprise doesn't work with LastPass. Really? Because I'm using LastPass with Win10 Enterprise and not having a problem. Google Authenticator is is actually what I use with LastPass. So I actually use the Microsoft Authenticator and the Google Authenticator. I bounce back and forth between them. So, all right, I want to see what Ashley has here for us because this is a lot of files changed. Add in some mediator notifications so that we can expand on for extensibility in the future. That sounds interesting. So let's 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 back up a second here. Okay. Mediator is a framework that we started introducing after we had our architecture workshop in the middle of July and we uh, we connected with our friend Jimmy Bogart. Jimmy Bogart makes the Mediator framework. It's a it's a nice tool to to give you a, a push towards enabling CQRS architecture. Once again, CQRS, Command, Query, Responsibility, Separation. <laughs> See, I'm congested now. This is weird. So, um, so, Mediator pushes us in that direction, and we end up creating command objects, command classes, and we end up creating query classes. A command object, it, it mutates state, right? We're going to, like this one, in our in our uh, wiki, we're going to create a new article, right? That's a command. Create this article. We might have a query that says get this article. So this is a command handler. So this will receive that command. And here it is. Create new article command. You can see it down here on line tw uh, 32. Why is it highlighting up there? My my mouse is down here. It'll receive this create new article command and go do something with it. Now, this is where we, we start to see the crossover, the jump between layers in our enterprise application. Um, as, as this grows, we're gonna have separate layers that do different things. And, and our friend Bra Brave Cobra put together a nice bit of documentation, some, some images that you, you can see, oh, excuse me, in the docs folder. Why am I, my mouse isn't lighting up right here. There we go. In the docs folder here, let me go over to new data. Uh, Bogno, Bo wow, Bogno Guso? Thank you for the follow. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Let me know. Um, so here in the docs, you can see some documentation about how these pieces work. There's going to be a back-end service when we get through this that does all the business logic for interacting with with the core mm, with the core core wiki. No, that manages all of the business logic for core wiki. 
There's a website front end that anybody with a browser can come to and interact with CoreWiki. And we want to build a mobile app at some point that people could use if you want to have, if, if right, CoreWiki is very generic, right? This could be customized and skinned to be anything. And the idea is at some point, not only do we have the, the CoreWiki service that has some collection of information about CoreWiki and whatever else, but you could deploy this if you just needed a little manual that, that you wanted to manage and be able to have folks connect into. And if you want people to be able to carry that little manual on their phone or wherever, you could install a CoreWiki app and have them connect and maybe download a copy of just those articles that are in that manual you need. So, um, and, and Brave Cobra and Ashley are, are starting to go towards what's going to become an application service that manages the various interactions and really starts becoming an, a separate server than the web server. So we'll end up with a web server that all it does is spits out angle brackets, curly braces to make web pages. But when it needs to interact with uh, creating articles in the repository or interacting with those articles or any of the business logic we want to do along the way there, like maybe there's editor workflow, right? Before an article gets published, it needs to be reviewed by a publisher or an editor, whatever. As we decide to build those things and notifications that happen, that might happen in an application service separate from the web server. That way our web servers can remain dumb. They don't do anything except generate angle brackets and curly braces. Have you tried building progressive web apps? Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to pronounce your, your chat handle there. Um, uh, but I, I will just call you uh, Diver, okay? Um, we try and stay family friendly here, and and I want to make sure that we we keep everybody on the same place here. Um, but Core Wiki is actually configured in a way that it it should be a progressive web app. So let me uh, let me do this. Let's do let me jump over to my project. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And let me pull this down. And if I do a, let me, uh, let's do .NET. No, it, it's not a problem, but I just want to make sure that you understand why I'm, why I'm saying what I am, okay? So, uh, here we go. Yeah, we want to make sure that ever that everybody's welcome here. That nobody has a has a question, has any any concerns. That service worker fails every time I run it. Yeah, there we put a service worker into Core Wiki. Where is it? Right. If I if we open up and go to the application right now, it should be working with a service worker. There we go. And if I have 12, let's do a reload here. So there is, there's Font Awesome. There's all, Font Awesome's coming from outside because it, I didn't merge in that dev branch. Um, I don't see the service worker. Is it errored on the console? Uh, da -da -da. Specified header was ignored. Nice. Uh, source map errors I don't care about those um, but all the stuff that you need including that manifest are here inside the project um, there's all the icons we even have an RSS feed uh, there's the manifest why didn't it get that but we did take steps to to make it more PWA Yes, this is going to be a fun merge, Brave Cobra. <laughs> this is. Uh, so, um, so Diver, it, it, it is something that we've, we've looked at. If that's something that you're interested in contributing to, you're more than welcome to take a look at how this works and um, interact with it, tinker with it, um, because it's one of those things that 
that we do want to learn more about, we want to be able to support. It'd be great to be able to deploy and put in in the Windows Store or in the uh, Chrome Play Store. I think that's what the other one is. So, um, but thank you for the comment. I, I think you're right. It's something that we should be able to support. We're getting there. Um, and we can come back to that and see what's going on there. But we're doing... We're doing some major refactorings here in the in the guts of the application. I want to take a look at what Ashley has for us in this pull request. It'll be difficult to do PWA without using a SPA. It's... Well, that's where I think we need to bring in our friend Mike Brocky. Angular guy, as I call him. Um, about a year... About two, three years ago, I visited the Pittsburgh... Uh, Pittsburgh.net user group and... and Mike does some tremendous contributions to the Angular community. And uh, I was very, very familiar with it, and we were talking about .NET Core. And I just started calling him Angular Guy because everybody in the room is asking about .NET, and there's the Angular Guy asking the questions. So really great guy. The tremendous respect for Mike. Um, and uh, he's, he's done a great job with stuff for the Angular CLI. Um, and uh, we're interested in having him join... Uh, Join us for for a build at some point. Uh, broke build CSH as repo now convert to CRLF. Oh no! Would a reason why we want business logic out of the razor pages? Um, well, we're already pushing business logic out of the razor pages. So or Blazor. There's another idea that we can do. All kinds of ways that we can skin the front end of this. And and I love I love that everybody's getting these great ideas about it. And that's and that's fantastic. Tinker with it. Let's see what we can put together here. There's a lot we can do with this. And that's what I like about the flexibility of this project. We can learn about Blazor by building a Blazor front end to this. We can learn about PWA by making it into a progressive web app with a SPA framework. Uh, oh, quick explanation of a PWA. So a PWA is a progressive web app. It's intended to function and feel a bit like a local application running on uh, running on your system and running locally. It uses some features that are common in modern web browsers like, uh, like the service worker object uh, and some other HTML5 features so it knows when it's offline or online and local storage so it'll take as much content as it can locally offline so that even when you're not connected to the website that it comes from it still functions and runs locally and Standby Reloading's got a great link there that from Google that tells you more about it but the, the concept very much is website as an app so all right, uh, did that uh, article. So what, what Ashley's done here, so this is our create article command helper. Let's see what, so Ashley has brought in uh, iMapper. This is from AutoMapper. AutoMapper is a tool that will allow you to do some of this. Look at this, this left side, right side coding here, right? This is, this is yak shaving. When you have to copy things from one object to the other object and they have the same name. I don't want to do that. So um, Ashley's brought that in along with uh, the mediator object into this command handler. I'm not sure why you need the mediator object, but let's follow along here. Stores local copies of those uh, features. Okay, a new command result. And a command result is an object that we put together just to be able to return something that says there was an exception, it was successful, some information to send back so that we know whether we need to retry or raise some sort of an error message to the to the individual working in the application. Like how Google Docs can run offline. Yes, exactly. That's exactly the type of feature that, that we're trying to promote here. You can go to the URL, save the site to your home screen on mobile, and then it opens up like an app when you, when you open it up. Yep, yep. So if you think about it, there's a lot of these little data snacking like I, applications where they do the exact same thing as the website. Well, why rebuild the website as a as an Android app or as an iPhone app when it's going to do the exact same thing and probably look the exact same way? And you see Twitter did this, where you can go and open the website and you can pin the website directly to your iPhone or your Android home screen, 
and it'll look and function the same way. And when you open it from the home screen, all of the Chrome, all of the goo that the browser puts around the application, like the address bar and the navigation buttons, go away, and you're just living inside of that website. Really neat stuff. Um, and it'll put an icon on the home screen specified in that head section, like you saw in uh, CoreWiki. So what what Ashley's done here is instead of doing this mapping, just said iMapper uh, Auto Mapper, turn that request that came in into an article awesome and then setting the published state to the current instant according to Noda time lockdown 6435 thank you so much for the follow i really appreciate that uh pushing us closer and closer to our rainbow beard goal oh my gosh i know i know they talked about the rainbow beard challenge on dotnet rocks we we talked about it uh, carl and richard thought it was a, a hoot um a hoot a hoot nanny they thought it was great, uh, and um, I think it's going out also in code project emails as well. So, all right, I'll get back to the code. So this get current instant, this is something we did for time management. We learned with John Skeet here on stream. Uh, John showed us how to work with Noda time to get very specific instances in time that are uh, easily managed across time zones. So our articles are published at an instant that's been defined by Noda time. So that's kind of cool that we still maintain that here with this refactoring that Ashley brought in. Uh, create article is create article with history. So there we're just passing in this. This is a, a data transfer object, not the request, this article, so that it knows here's what I want to create. And then this is this. This is the piece that uh, that I know Brave Cobra and Ashley have been talking about. Um, we're going to do. <laughs> I'm noticing standby reloading's last message. Um, the the next piece here is that occurs inside of CQRS is the is the concept of notifications. So at the point when you send in a command you don't want to necessarily return a response that says, oh, this thing happened, right? A command should be dumb. It should just, it, it should be fire and forget. Go do this thing and, you know, I, I don't need to know anything more about it. A notification will notify the rest of the application that this thing happened. And if anybody's listening for that notification, they can pick up and do something with it. Right? There might be something interesting there that they need to interact with. Well, this may be one of those things that you want to uh, do something with. Excluded await on the notification specifically for the fire and forget nature. Makes sense. So the publish, the public publish action on the mediator. And the mediator is the central broker of activity in the application. Um, publish is asynchronous. So Ashley's publishing and saying, go do this. I don't care what happens. Return control immediately. Now, create new comment command right now. So this is a new command that, that Ashley's created. Uh, it's a request that takes has a command result that will be returned. And see, I'm not... Mm, I worry about wrapping, having a command that, that wraps something that isn't a primitive. Um, it, good point, Brave Cobra. Yes, it, it it's an in-memory event bus. It's an in-memory... Um, let's back off of event bus for just a second. It's an in-memory set of queues so that things fire and are notified out to appropriate um, application services that are concerned about those, want to handle those, those tasks and process them appropriately. An event bus is just a collection of, of cues. It's like, uh, I'm going to go back to Bill and Ted again. Um, Bill and Ted, it's like the circuits of time. Right? Did you see Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure? It's like this. Right? It's on Pinterest. It's, yeah, show me the picture. You stink. Show me the picture. 
fine, go away. I'll find a different picture. I'll choose this picture. No, that picture. There we go. So it's it's like this, where, and let's just view image, much better. Where, right, If these are, in, in the movie Bill and Ted, these are the circuits of time that connect different points in time. In our application, these are the different cues that we have, and you're sending a message down it, kind of like Bill and Ted's uh, phone booth here. And somewhere along the way, something's listening at the other end that's actually going to take action on it. The event bus is all of these things together, and it's listening and managing the traffic across all of them. So by by making this an in-memory event bus, it happens very, very quickly, but it's only it's restricted to one machine that ha that has right that memory boundary. Now, at some point, you're gonna want to scale and you're gonna want to bring on a second machine. Well, there's ways to do that and take that in-memory event bus and put it out of memory on an external machine so that these queues are being managed between machines and things can get a lot more, a lot can scale a lot better without actually, um, without actually having to rebuild your application. All you're doing is opening it up and saying, uh, put these objects on the event bus and those other machines subscribe and attach to the event bus and you don't care about them, right? You don't have to, you have to manage their uptime and downtime, but as a system architect, they're just another endpoint on the bus. I was going to make those primitive, but then I couldn't remember the reason why we did, so I kept them as objects. It can be refracted, refractored to primitives. I'm not going to go crazy about it, um, but uh, I'll express my thoughts here. I'm not going to dig in here and change anything unless there's something significant that, that we as a group have a concern about, uh, but we can refactor later. The, the concern here, right, a primitive are those simple data types, of course, that we get with .NET, string, int, long, bool, it, string isn't really a primitive, but car, uh, character type, um, decimal, double, um, those primitive types, I like to see those passed on these types of objects because what's happened here is um, by referencing a, a plain old C-sharp object here, a POCO, like article or comment, um, this command is now directly coupled to that object type. And if I change that object, I inadvertently change this command also. So it becomes something that that dependency, the, uh, the dependency that this command relies on, that article or comment object, may inadvertently change the way it behaves. GitHub is having issues. Red alert, red alert. GitHub is having issues. Run. I'm just looking. I We're okay here. I haven't merged anything at this point, so I'm okay. So that's the create new command. And we started doing this. We started working on creating new commands. So Ashley's already taken these steps. Here's the create new command handler. It takes in a comment repository. This is what's going to interact with our database. The clock, mapper, mediator handle that command request. So it's going to create a command result, map it, uh, create it in the database. That's it right here. Excuse me, comment repository, create that comment in the database and then publish a notification that says, hey, we created this. Makes perfect sense. If there was an exception, like exemption? If there was an exception, Let's mark it as not completed successfully and then raise an appropriate exception. And I like now, it looks like Ashley's introducing some of these more context specific exceptions, right? So specifically, this exception happened because create comment failed. That's nice. That's, that's a, a simple exception object, I believe, right? If we find this real quick. There we go. And all it's, it, right? We can put text that's appropriate for us here, but having these extra little exception objects make it easier for us to track down and identify exactly why a problem happen happened. As long as Stack Overflow doesn't go down at the same time as GitHub, absolutely. 
that'll be that'll be the the end of uh, civilization. That'll be a real problem there. Um, GitHub webhooks are taking longer to trigger. Notify on PRs. Well, that's not too too bad. So you should serialize deserialize the objects in this in some way as you pass them around. That's a, that's a very good point. You should serialize these objects. Um, and if you if you are passing some of these POCOs, right, plain old C sharp objects or CLR objects, um, they and and they need to start jumping out of your system. They need to be serializable. So not only does this object need to be serializable, uh, serializable of course being converted from this in memory type to something that we can write to disk, right, or pass over the wire, right, JSON, XML, protocol buffers. Choose your flavor. Um, we want to be able to make this into something that we can transport over the wire or to disk. Um, so some of these, and that's an, another really good reason to make things primitives because primitives are always serializable. Uh, uh, Yoakum, is that Yoakum Turk 16? Uh, Merry birthday. Thank you. I appreciate the kind birthday wishes. Is there something in the universe that is not serializable? Um, well, you run into issues with things like byte arrays, right? Hence my reason for a DTO instead of a d domain object. Very good point. Very good point, Brave Cobra. Um, a DTO, a data transfer object, um, is intended to be very serializable and be very primitive with no business logic on it at all. Where a domain object is expects to be richer and have uh, your business, some of your business logic built into it. Uh, some of your processing could be inside of there that you need to do appropriate for your system. Um, of course, this is a wiki, so these business objects aren't terribly complicated yet. We're going to add features that make them complicated soon. Um, so that way, right, those domain objects, when we need to do the business lo uh, logic, we can make them up take our business logic actions on there and send off appropriate notifications or commands or requests over to the event bus or the mediator. Um, and then the system reacts appropriately as those actions occur, uh, interact and occur. Okay, we're getting there. I'm what, 29 this year? How did you guess? 27. Okay, now cut that out. Notice, all right, let me, hang on, let me do this. Let's do this. Let's go back over here. Um, so I've been trimming the mustache and I've been letting the beard grow. And it's, it's. I'm gonna get into full ZZ top territory here in a couple weeks uh, because I wanna make sure that, that we got a lot to paint rainbow colored here if we get there in October. So we're, uh, we're gonna make that a thing, I think. Rainbow beard, it would not be noticeable. Absolutely. <laughs> you wouldn't know what, uh, what age I am. And actually, you can kind of see in my face, I've been sleeping better. Making a Viking beard? That's cool. So this is the Create New Comment Handler, and it's doing all of those things to manage the comments. And it's it, and it's very simple, right? Receive this object, write it into the database, right? And and these are almost becoming simplistic, right? That they're, they're doing the exact same thing over and over again, at which point you could even refactor some of these into a common uh, type of request handler and right have very similar inner bit here where it's just doing the map and calling the appropriate method in the database and really cut this down even more if you have a lot of very similar standard things that you're going to do. Here's delete article. So when we're going to delete, we're going to pass in a slug. A slug is the... Uh, Right is is the bit of the query string that defines that uniquely defines the article that we want to load. So we're literally pulling it right off the query string and saying delete this thing. Here's the handler that goes with it. It's going to receive that delete command, and it's going to pass it into our database repository and say delete this thing. Raise an appropriate exception if there's a problem, and then here's our exception classes. This is great stuff, Ashley. This is really great stuff. And then article created notification. So this is an I notification. This is an object that'll be passed onto our event bus into our queues. If anybody wants to listen for this thing, needs to know, hey, when an article is created, I need to know because we're gonna go take 
this business action. We're going to send a notification to the publisher. We're going to send uh, uh, we're going to send an email out to all the readers to say, hey, there's a new article on the homepage. Whatever, right? That's where we might have this type of notification interaction, and we can set up objects to listen for these notifications explicitly, right? Uh, comment posted notification. Now this feeds into something that we started doing with our friend Amanda Iverson uh, from Codefellows some time ago. So Amanda helped us write a little system that when a comment is posted to an article that you wrote, you'll receive an email that says, hey, there was, an ar there was a comment posted to your article. So this might be interesting in helping to move some of that notification logic, right? So that's email notification logic out into another place where that can be isolated, receive this information, and then behave appropriately. I am confusion. What do you? What can I help with, uh, uh, Yakum Turk? Um, so delete homepage notif delete homepage attempt notification. That's interesting. Come back to that. Uh, so here's the query for get article, right? So we want to get an article. And it looks like you just simplified this significantly. That's fine. Uh, get article by ID is an or is a request that takes in an ID and returns an article. That makes sense. Get article handler. So these are queries, right? Go get this thing based on this piece of information. Get article by slug, or if it's a get article by ID, and this is nice. So this is one class and it implements two different types of handlers. Handle these two different types of requests, get article or get article by ID. And it's really doing the exact same thing. So to centralize, it works nice. Am I going to shave my eyebrow off? No, no, we are not doing any eyebrow shaving. Uh, I haven't filled the homepage delete attempt notification out yet, but it will be a little thing to track if someone is trying to do something naughty. That's an interesting, that's an interesting idea, and, and it, it's it's being able to track and handle those types of security issues. Um, I'd be interested to see your feedback on that, Ashley, uh, and and how that goes and what that should do. Uh, that me zero. Uh, good morning, that me. Wel welcome. How can you find yourself in a big project? How do you organize yourself? Um, my organization is terrible. There's a there's a reason there's a reason why there's a picture of my office behind me because that was the last time it was clean. Okay, <laughs> um, right? Because that's that that's not real. I'm gonna do the chroma key thing again here. Right? That's that's fake. Woo! I'm in front of a green screen. Um. So, um. How do I so how do I organize myself? There's a bunch of ways to organize yourself on a project, um, and our f if you if you look at the architecture workshop videos that we have on YouTube, there's a bunch of different architecture considerations that show good ways to organize your code. Um, in the C Sharp workshop that we had as well, our friend Steve Smith gave us another talk for an hour in there where he he talked a little bit about um, was it in that one? We talked about clean coding with Steve. It wasn't in there, but we did on another episode. We talked about clean coding and how to organize your code so that you have tests in one project and how you organize the objects that you're working with. Um, and that's a great comment from Brave Cobra. Think before writing, not the other way around. Do a little bit of planning up front. Be ready to refactor mercilessly as you see redundancy and it'll start to come together. Some of these different objects that you see again and again, we have handlers here that we're grouping together and exceptions. We've got several different exceptions. Let's group those together into a folder that we can make easier to manage. And you'll see more of that um, as we progress here. And, and hopefully as you're watching and we're writing code here, some of this will, will start to click and land with you with how we're organizing our code. And I'm gonna try and get through the rest of these changes here real quick so we can go over to the code and see how this actually works and is organized a bit. Uh, Joachim Turk asks, and I, I hope I'm pronouncing that, is it Joachim? Asks, how long did I study to program? Um, uh, years, years and years. Um, in school, 
I didn't even, I wasn't even studying the program at school. I was studying management sciences and information systems. Uh, I have a Bachelor of Science from the, uh, the business school at Pennsylvania State University. Um, and uh, uh, so I actually have management skills in my background and uh, accounting and economics. Um, but uh, I focused on my IT skills, my development skills, and really, I learned all that on my own. And you absolutely should be still learning. There's so much to learn. That's the one thing about software development that you, you, you need to take to heart when you go into this field, is you will constantly be learning. The only constant in the, the software industry is change. E technology industry also, hardware, constant is change. My, my kids, they, they're going to go to college here in a couple years, and you know what? There might not be an iPhone on the other side of college. There might be some other device. Before, right, when, when I went to college, mobile phones were a huge thing that you carried in your, in your, uh, in your backpack, right? We had mobile phones that looked like this. Look at that thing. Yeah! And they had keyboards, too. Things change all the time. This phone is about 10 years old, a little bit more than 10 years old. It's, I keep it as a reminder how far we've come in mobile phones. Um, and my kids, you know, they've always lived with an iPhone, with an Android phone. They, these things are just out there. So be ready for change. Be ready to learn. Let's learn together. Let's share together, because the more we share, the more everybody has, and the better we'll all do. What's the best uh, Microsoft cert to get for C Sharp web development and or architects? You know what, I don't look at the certifications right now. I haven't, I'm not quite sure. I couldn't recommend one or the other right now. Uh, let's see. Okay. So, article repository now has a delete action. That's fine. Uh, so, comment DAO. So, these are data access objects. These are the objects that we're writing and interacting with, right, in the database. So, this is specific to the data model that we're using, which I believe this is... And this is fine. This is just some renaming or refactoring uh, yeah so this is entity framework that we're using to save so these are specific objects to entity framework and this kind of makes sense the delete interactions uh, so a new test to simplify that's fine configure auto mapper is changing because we're adding new maps so we're mapping from article to article details from article to article delete View models comment to domain comment. Now, th this is saying ignore these values. That's kind of neat to see. Create map, and this is how we're going to do this conversion from create new article. No, from article to create new article. No, it was create new article to article because it returns a new article. Makes sense. So really, those things that we hand coded in all those different places are configured here to make it easier to do. Uh, configure mediator. Now, why did we have... Well, it just discovers these things, doesn't it? So we're okay there. Our delete page now uses the new delete information and the new d delete command. Details. So details we've been really working on and trying to simplify here. So it looks like we really chopped this down to just receiving mediator and mapper. And details does a get article. All right, I'll look at that arc, that link in a minute. D -d 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 new comment notification handler. Yeah, we're going to end up moving this out somewhere else. Uh, and then DTO extensions, this is getting this is going to disappear. All right, <clears throat> so a ton of stuff here. We know it, it builds properly. Um, and we've reviewed all of the code, so let's, uh, let's merge this. 
And then I want to take a look at, what was that article? 273. Thank you for taking care of this massive refactoring. A huge help. That's great stuff. Thank you so much, Ashley, for taking that. Oh, here we go from, look at this. <laughs> While we were on stream, and it's not building properly. Update to Cake 030, update to .NET SDK 214, Docker image to 213, ASP.NET Core runtime. Hmm. When the tool is installed, enter repo and type .NET Cake. Yep. So it looks like there's, uh, yeah. GitHub is having issues, okay. All right, so this is, it's not building properly because of the uh, issue on GitHub. All right. Hey, there's our friend Kevin Griffin. Good morning. Um, I have a hard stop here in just a few minutes. Not even going to check if it works. Well, I had checkboxes there that proved that it works. <laughs> let's, uh, let's pull down. And uh, we will .NET run. SDK should probably be 21401 now. I don't want to chase SDKs every time they're released here. Let's... There we go. That's loaded. So here's 8081. And there we go. Looks the same. My latest changes look like they work. I can open these up. I like big software architecture, and I cannot lie. Yeah, that's a thing. But what I do have... What do you have? ...are a very particular set of skills. Skills I have acquired over a very long career. A very long career. I just had a GitHub issue where my PR was closed by me seconds after creating it. Oh, Mr. Regs, that sounds weird. I do check as I go, but good to make sure. Yeah, uh, looks like we're in good shape here. We've also got our diff feature here. And I think this is really cool. The the diff showing us the changes. All right. So, sure looks like it's working properly. Uh, it, fantastic. If you do want to refactor further, go for it. I absolutely encourage that. Um, so, so, it looks like... This looks like it, and I'm, I'm blanking on your name, your real name. Ma Matthias um, says that we're just having a problem with GitHub and the webhook integration here. Um, so there's no rush to get this in right now, but I will absolutely merge this. Let's come back to it on Thursday. Hopefully we're on the other side of the, these GitHub issues. It should be on the other side of it. And we'll do this merge at that point. Um, so th this looks like some pretty good housekeeping to get us on the current and latest version of the tools. But no rush because everything is building still and working properly. All right, um, let's see here. Where was I? So we merged in all those changes. We have it all it now running locally here. Okay, here's the project, reload. And my test explorer right there above my head should wake up here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There we go. So, let's clean the solution and rebuild it. Well, actually, Test Explorer should just do it itself. Live unit testing is running. So live unit testing is, is this great continuous testing feature that'll show us that, yes, as we're writing code, all of our tests continue to work. I mean, in, in less than a full second, it finished running all of those tests. It 
it it builds in the background and runs and shows me exactly what is working and what isn't working so this is this is really great i'm i'm really happy with where we are with the application that um, we've introduced this more complex uh, structure and built in um, it started building towards uh, more complex workflows, more interesting features. Am I, am I working on these projects offline, not during stream? If I am, I'm not committing them directly into one of the repositories because I do want to, to share that work with you. Um, and it's it's something that um, that I, I this is very much a teaching project, um, and it's something that that there are folks who come on here and aren't uh, and I, I forgot to wave to Mr. Regs. Hello, Mr. Regs. Who aren't um, familiar with ASP.NET Core, who aren't familiar with Visual Studio, that I want to make sure that they're not intimidated and they see us write some code and it kind of makes sense how the pieces go together. So with those bits of refactoring, and, and there was a question about how this how this is organized. Um, I we're, we're moving into this this uh, organization where we have our web application here at CoreWiki. And we should probably rename that to CoreWiki.web to make it clear that this is the web application. We have CoreWiki application, and this is where all of these things that do the interactions between those various commands and queries, right? This is the central application that doesn't really have a user interface that does all of all of the interactions with the database happens here inside of application. Um, I'm going to skip core for a second. Entity framework is where all of our interactions with the database occurred, occurs. There we go. So here's the objects that allow us to work with those database objects. And here's those data access objects. These are the database objects that we're interacting with. These get mapped directly to something in the database. And using Entity Framework, some of these features that you see here actually get translated into database requirements, right? So database features. So that's what's going on in this project. Uh, next one down, notifications. This is what's actually sending emails back and forth to various uh, other services. So confirmation email, when we need to send a confirmation, hey, you signed up for our service. You know, we want to confirm that this properly is you, forgot password email, new comment email. So we have these objects and then we have templates here. They're razor templates that'll be applied and format appropriately. So it comes out in some nice HTML that says, please confirm your email address. Nice. So that's a little bit about the organization. And then this test project at the end here, this is our unit tests. So you can see exactly how we're testing the project. Um, the one that I skipped, core, this has a bunch of cross-cutting objects that we really need to use across the entire application. So as the application grows, as it changes, these things will be reused in more and more across the application. So things like our application configuration, things like these domain objects that we want to be able to start up really inside of our application object, application project, maintain and interact with. I have a feeling these are gonna migrate to over there. Interfaces that can be used across different projects. So these are database interfaces, these really give us a way to pass around references to our database framework. And at some point, we're going to introduce other database frameworks here like MongoDB, Cosmos DB, um, Postgres. We can use Postgres with Entity Framework, but there's some little bit of changes you have to make in order to implement in order to make that work. So those are all coming. Um, and then all of our build items are up in this top project. So I think to the to the question that I had earlier, and I've, I'm sorry, I forget who asked it um, about organizing. I think I hope this makes it a little bit clearer how we're organizing these things to make it easier to find. 
Just spotted a new chat option. Readable colors. Really? That's interesting. Okay. Um, there was also a question here. I thought I saw... Who was it? Uh, oh, uh, that me zero. What do you think about Django? Is it worthy? Django's Django's nice. Uh, it's a it's a Python framework that does very much an MVC type of thing. If you're in a Python and and that's something you enjoy, go for it. I um, the the challenge that I have with Python and why I really like either either the Java or the .NET frameworks. Um, there's a there's a huge huge commercial community built up for support around both java and .net frameworks if you need commercial support for your application i, I can't even think about looking at django um it's you're you're going to get tremendous support from from microsoft from oracle from name a java vendor um but you can absolutely do uh do tremendous web development with with Django. You can do it with Flask. You can do it with with Node.js. It, it's the the question that I think folks need to answer for themselves is when and where do I need support from somebody? Who do I call for a problem? Because at some point you're going to need to pick up the phone and get somebody on the line when something goes wrong. It's not a question of if. It's a question of when. And that's the type of thing that having having a big vendor manage your your webs your your development tools becomes beneficial and if that if that is something you need that's a reason that those organizations are going to favor who you're going to call absolutely so because if you don't and you blow it you'll blow it and you you could be in a real bad place and i think back to even uh it was the uh, the struts problem that was occurring I think it was in, tar in Target's web framework and they didn't update their, their framework appropriately they didn't stay that was an open source framework that uh, they, they didn't get the support installed appropriately from the open source project and it really hurt their business uh, make your website in C++ with web CGI <laughs> 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 that's pretty good <laughs> uh, <clears throat> all right um i need to get running here i have a hard stop <clears throat> excuse me um c17 i like to use both python django flask and net different tools for different tasks absolutely there's and net has given you the flexibility to do that and our friends on uh, on the Peach Pi framework have made PHP compile down to .NET so that you can get that that feature. So, thank you, Mr. Tethys. I appreciate that. Uh, the the compliment on the .NET Rocks episode. Um, yes, <laughs> Dark Souls of web development. Um, I am going to to wrap up here all we did was some pull requests today i think that's okay i think we did a we did a lot here um we've we've really accomplished a bit there was a lot to merge there we reviewed a lot of great source code from our friends ashley from chris um and smab had some updates in there um let's uh let's just wrap it up here and we're, what we're going to do, I will, of course, archive off this episode. If you want to go back and take a look at anything, you want to uh, review any of the changes that we made, um, everything will be over on YouTube. For those of you that are on YouTube, thanks so much for watching. Hit the subscribe button up at the top. Let us know that you enjoy this, and you'll be notified every time there's a new episode released. And, of course, you can join us live on Twitch. Tuesdays, Thursdays, Fridays, Saturdays, 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Uh, Pacific, uh, 1400 UTC, and 8 p.m. India Standard Time. I'll be back on Thursday. We're going to go through, and we're going to... We're going to do a little bit more refactoring here in CoreWiki. Uh, thank you, Paul Hoffman, Paolo Hoffman. I appreciate you joining us. It looks like I've got another person here, Arbapo, about to join. 
Thank you so much for the follows. Um, I think our friend Code Rushed is getting ready for a stream, and we can set up <clears throat> to raid our friend Mark Miller over there on the Code Rushed stream. He should be starting in just a minute. Right, let's take a look-see. He might be hosting me right now. <laughs> he is. All right. Um, so we're going to do a little bit more refactoring on, on CoreWiki, but I, I actually want to go back and take a look at our Stream Tools project. And there's a couple things I want to do here to improve our bot that, that lives in the chat room, and I think we'll hit that a little bit next time as well. So on Thursday, we'll be writing some more code and working with some Twitch APIs using uh, the Stream Tools project next time. Just go a little bit different, do, do something a little bit more fun. So, alrighty. Let's, um... Why isn't Mark starting yet? Where you at, Mark? Limbell, thank you for the follow. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. He should be starting shortly here. Where is he? Uh, how many hats do I have? See, I gotta figure. I gotta fix some of those questions. Let's see. So, yep, I've got a noon call. I need to get to. Thoughts on TypeScript from Timbal? I'll answer that question real quick. I think TypeScript is is terrific because it brings that static typing, that compile ahead of time. Uh, and linting experience directly to the JavaScript developers who are very familiar with working dynamically, but when you need a little bit more structure, when you need to grow your application into something a little bit more complex and you want those assurances so that you don't get burned later on because a dynamic type changed or, or something didn't compile quite right, uh, it's going to create a real, could create a real problem. So. That's why I like TypeScript, but of course, TypeScript is JavaScript, or JavaScript is TypeScript. Yeah, really great stuff. Um, I I really enjoy using TypeScript. So, someone asked about attributionware pair programming. Uh, that's possible via GitHub co-author. Oh, I didn't know you could do that. Very cool. I think that was Ashley and Brave Cobra looking at that. All right. Um, I don't think Mark's starting up here. What, uh, where can you find Fritz merch? There is a store down below the Twitch stream here you can find. It's over on Redbubble. What am I, I was drinking coffee, but in the, uh, in the shaker, I've got some G Fuel in there. This is G, Fu G Fuel Fruit Punch flavored. Sugar-free, gluten-free, all the good stuff. And, uh, it's been quite nice. So, I think we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, yeah, it looks like nobody's ready for me to raid. Yeah. Oh, oh, what do we got here? Monday, Wednesday, Thursday. All right, so he is not hosting today. Cool. I will, uh, I'll catch you next time. That'll be on Thursday. Thanks so much for joining me, everybody. We'll see you then. See ya.